Hi everybody, I'm American Johnson. This is Non-Compete. If you want to skip ahead to the feature presentation of this video, just go to this time code. That'll take you to the meat and potatoes. In the meantime, we're going to have a little meta discussion about some developments with this channel. About a little bit over a year ago, I did a video expressing my regret that I didn't spend more time listening to and engaging with comrades who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And I felt like that gave me some massive blind spots. And that's why, you know, I was unfortunately taken by surprise by the uprising, the Black Lives Matter uh, protests. And, and uh, you know, that was a big failing on my part. In the time since then, I've done a lot to try to rectify that. I've had conversations with comrades from all around the world who do not look like me, and I'm proud of that work. But unfortunately, if you're only subscribed to the flagship non-compete channel that you're watching right now, you probably haven't seen any of that work. That's because it's primarily through live streams that these conversations have been taking place. I've had wonderful conversations with comrades from all around the world. Unfortunately, around the same time I started having these discussions, we were getting a lot of complaints from people who were saying they aren't interested in live streams. You know, we were having our live streams on this same channel and people were saying, you know, we don't, I don't want to watch two hour videos, three hour videos. They're clogging up my timeline. And a lot of people were telling us that that's why they were unsubscribing. I don't blame those people for doing that. I blame the YouTube platform for not giving you the ability to granularly decide what kind of content you see. You should be able to just say, I don't want to see live streams, but YouTube doesn't give you that option. So we now obnoxiously have three channels and, uh, you know, we have this non-compete channel you're watching now, non-compete live, which is where we have the full live streams and the archives of those live streams and non-compete highlights, which is where we have shorter highlight clips from the live stream. So I just wanted you to be aware of those. I encourage you to subscribe to them if you want to see some really, really cool discussions with some really, really interesting comrades uh, from, again, from all around the world. And the video you're about to watch is a highlight clip from a live stream we had just a couple days ago. And specifically, we will be hearing from um, an indigenous Maori comrade named Tali Faulkner. And he's also, by the way, a video game developer and developed an amazing game called Umurangi Generation. I'll put a link to that in the description. In that video game, you will learn about many of the same uh, similar topics to what you're gonna hear about in the, in the video you're about to see. So if you're interested in what you see today, I do just recommend that you go check out that, that game. But anyway, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's listen now to Tali and Tali's analysis on semiotics and Umberto Eco and the ways in which a lot of us have misinterpreted or abused Umberto Eco's 14 points of fascism. Self-crit, I myself, a couple years ago, I think made a video in which I made some similar mistakes to the ones Tali describes. So none of us are immune to these um, to mistakes like these. And, you know, we're all going to learn together now from Tali. Enjoy. Non-compete highlights. I asked EJ to come on today because I guess something that I've been noticing a lot when it comes to these debate spaces is they incorrectly use the texts of fascism by Umberto Eco and they don't quite understand what it means. And I wanted to just sort of come on and talk a little bit about that because I think there's a very big problem with people misunderstanding what that text is actually about. And I think that's why, you know, we're now seeing a lot of these debate bros, the first thing they'll try and do in a conversation is say, define fascism, and then they'll say, oh, it's traits or characteristics or something like that. What is absolute yeah. fascism and now It's really easy to be great to get a definition okay. from Vosh, yeah. Ah. Well, generally, it's considered to be like a um, an ultra right wing, ultra nationalistic um, form of like um, usually like an ethno nationalist political identity. Um, I prefer Umberto Eco's fourteen points, but it gets like really in the weeds. I don't think that fascism Umberto is always Eco. super consistent with its definition. And what they're trying to do is bring up the fascism definition so that they can characterize, for example, just recently Professor Flowers or you know when Indigenous people come on to try to equate them to fascists, right? I'm I'm both sizing this. I'm enlightened centrist uh, between <laughs> black and white nationalism. So I consider myself a black nationalist, but I. I'm not really interested in like de destroying white people or hurting them. I am more interested in the empowerment of black people. And I, most black nationalists- but that's, what, I, that's what they'd say though. Like that's what white nationalists would also tell me. Yes, but white whiteness is predicated on destruction and exclusion, isn't it? 
But it's, that's only the case because whites are the hegemonically powerful group. The same thing could be said of uh, Han Chinese um, ethno-nationalism in China or of like Hindu supremacy in India. At the end of the day, whichever group is most powerful is going to be the destructive hegemonic ethnic group. And you're telling me exactly what white nationalists have told me. The only difference is you guys just don't have the power to start fucking people over yet. But give it a hundred years, you know, Africa's growing pretty fast. I guarantee you that <laughs> give it a little bit of time, you, you motherfuckers are going to end up being just as dangerous. Because when they use this definition, Umberto Eco's definition is great, but they're not using it in a semiotic context. They're using it to sort of ascribe that this is like a way of hunting down what the ideology is. So when these debate bros are using the definition of fascism from the text Ur Fascism by Umberto Eco, this is an author from the field of semiotics. To properly understand this definition, you need to understand semiotic theory. And that's something I've got right here. This is Umberto Eco's text on semiotics, okay? And this is inspired by Saussure and Pierce and stuff like that. It's self-evident um, from how these, you know, groups use it, um, that it's not something they're aware of. Like, they don't, they don't think about semiotic theory when they read this. Yeah, there it is right there, right? And it's the first thing that comes up when you Google definition exactly. of fascism on Wikipedia, right? Now, what's really interesting as well in that Wikipedia page is it also lists like George Orwell's definition of fascism, which is, you know, this sort of liberal equation to say, oh, it's it's like bad people that borrow things from socialists or something, right? This definition is what they'll try to corner people into. And it's not a socialist definition, nor a libertarian definition, and therefore not a libertarian socialist definition. It's from once again, semiotics. Semiotics is a field which is about looking at signs and meaning and their understanding, right? When it was sort of in its first original phase, it's sort of that idea that, you know, an arrow means go this way, right? And then when you get Piercean semiotics, it's sort of that idea that when you see this sign, you have what's called an interpretant, which is not the person, but like sort of the response your brain has to when you see it. A really famous example of someone misinterpreting that idea is actually that clip of Jordan Peterson where he says women want to be raped because they have red lipstick and, and tight heels and stuff. We don't know what the rules are. Like, what? here's a rule. Don't, don't How you... about no makeup in the workplace? Why would that be a rule? <laughs> Why should you wear makeup in the workplace? Uh, Isn't that sexually provocative? No. It's not? No. Well, what is it then? What's the purpose of makeup? Some people would like to just put on makeup. Why? To, <laughs> to, to, I don't know why. Why do you make your lips red? Because they turn red during sexual arousal. That's why. Why do you put rouge on your cheeks? Same reason. I mean, look. How about high heels? What, what are mean, they what for? What about high heels? What about them? They're there to, to exaggerate sexual attractiveness. That's what high heels do. Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't use sexual displays in the workplace. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that that is what they're doing. And that is what they're doing. If, if, do you feel like a serious woman who does not want sexual harassment in the workplace, do you feel like if she wears makeup in the workplace that she is somewhat being critical. Yeah. That's actually from an introductory book in the semiotic discipline called Lipstick and Cigarettes, right? He's, he's misinterpreting that as well. But basically the idea is to say when people create these kind of signs, either through like marketing or like fictional sorts of things, they can use like semiotics to indicate things visually, right? Like another example could be this idea that if you're a smoker and you see a no smoking sign, the no smoking sign, it has a picture of a cigarette with, a, with an arrow through it. And that's not saying cigarettes are here and and when we, and we cross them out, it's you, your interpreter and says, I can't smoke here, right? And if you're a smoker, you might be like, fuck, you know, have to go go in the corner or something, right? And basically like, Alberto Echo's definition of where that goes to is really like abstract. Anything that determines something else, an interpretant, to refer to an object, which itself refers the object in the same way, the interpretant becoming in turn a sign and then so ad infinium. And it's that idea to say anything can be a sign and then that sort of interpretant can become a sign as well. So it's like this sort of thing where you can keep going with it. And an example of that, I would say in Australia's nation state is how the color blue is used semiotically to sort of reinforce that colonial ancestry, if that makes sense. So like the Australian f flag is blue and that's to reference back to Captain Cook's jacket, which was blue. And then, you know, when you start to see where all of those like semiotic links start to happen, you see that the way they're doing the nation building is semiotically, right? It's not a hard field to understand. Like it's very well understood. It's just the kind of thing where when you read Umberto Eco's or fascism, it's very obviously a semiotic text. And when you read it, it's obviously not saying that, you know, like anyone who fits this definition is therefore a fascist. It's about looking at the aesthetics and characteristics of saying, this is what this ideology does. Like this is the signs associated with it. 
So, when Umberto Eco lists off the 14 signs of fascism, he doesn't mean these are clues that someone is secretly a fascist. He means this is a way of saying these are 14 semiotic examples of the aesthetic and characteristics of fascism. Now, if you claim to be a socialist, the context which separates communists and fascists is the role of capitalism. If you've read or listened to the talks by Michael Parenti, you will know that fascists are always funded by capitalists to protect stolen wealth. It is why this is a far-right ideology, okay? That's the key bit of context which is almost never acknowledged when Vosch goes into equating settler colonialism and indigenous groups as comparable. For example, if white supremacists successfully executed a coup tomorrow and took over America for the second time, the redistribution of land would not be for all the white people but for the wealthiest Americans being privileged first, with mass amounts of lands granted to grow their wealth. You need only look at when Americans did this the first time with the doctrine of manifest destiny and the vast amounts of wealth, both tangible and intangible, which were stolen. There's a very big difference between looking at that text and saying anything that fits in this definition is therefore fascist versus being able to actually like look and semiotically say, okay, in the context of fascism, you can identify it. And I think the key point in that text, because I've read it a bunch, right, is Umberto Eco talks about this concept of the family resemblance to fascism, right? Where he says, this fascist group can look different to this fascist group semiotically, right? It'll have different traits from that list, but you know they're both fascist. And the thing that I would argue is that the thing that leaks them is their relationship and role to capitalism. For example, like cult of tradition, obviously fascists have that, you know, and when they sort of have this idea of, you know, going back to traditional ways. But, you know, as an indigenous person, I have that belief as well, obviously, with the stolen, you know, culture and the destruction of things like that, where I go, oh, well, I want to sort of connect with my tupuna and like, you know, start to learn those traditional ways because they were taken from us, right? And it's the same with like all of these. You can fit these into just about anything. And when Umberto Eco sort of wrote this, you see that it's this thing. And then there's a description of trying to give more context to it, you know what I mean? Or an example. And yeah. it's just this kind of thing where like you have to be completely brain dead to have such a, oh, I know exactly what I'm talking about because a six page pamphlet told me okay and not actually understand who the author is i mean this is a broader critique of like wikipedia as a whole is that you know when you scroll up a little bit this wikipedia page says this is a definition of fascism and that means that the person who put this into fucking wikipedia did not understand the text and that's why you don't trust wikipedia that is why it is the first thing if you ever join a university they will tell you don't fucking trust wikipedia you don't know who's putting the information in there so like you don't know their political ideology and you don't know if they are even understanding the text correctly and umberto eco the author of this text he's a postmodernist, all right who was aware of Marx, but definitely was not a Marxist or a socialist. And if you know anything about the postmodernist movement, it was very much this thing where they, like a lot of them died on their sword for neoliberalism. Like, you know, you can look at Foucault when he talks about like business owners and stuff like that. If you're a socialist, why aren't you using a definition that is a socialist definition of fascism? Why are you using a neoliberal postmodernist definition? You know what I mean? Unless your ideology actually is a neoliberal postmodern definition and the reason you find it so comfortable is because you're actually like secretly adding yourself as something that everyone kind of already guessed. So when these debate bros smugly chuckle that this definition fits what they'll call tankies and fascists and try to say these are the same groups or communists totally fit the definition of, of, of what fascism is because they'll look through these semiotic things and say, ah, I can see that, I can see that, right? But the big thing is they don't understand the poor principle of the semiotic relationships between objects, signs, and interpreters, right? The 14 representamen, um, which Eco details, are perfect for looking at fascism through this lens, okay? But it is not a definition of the ideology. It is not a definition you use to try and identify someone as a fascist. Context matters in semiotics. What is happening around the sign is important for us to correctly interpret the meaning. For example, if I do this, okay, an okay hand sign, and I am in a scuba diving scenario, that it means you know, okay, my, my oxygen is coming through. If I do this and I am a white nationalist, I am doing this because I am basically trying to say, hey, I trigger the libs by doing the white power sign. And because of that, you know, you know, I'm one of you, right? Like we, we saw this with the Christchurch shooter and stuff like that. I think it's very interesting that these guys sort of cut their teeth on saying, I'm able to identify when Nazis are dog whistling, you know, look at the clown world, look at um, the NPC meme, look at Pepe, look at, um, you know, the okay hand sign, all this stuff. And then, 
there's this total blindness to everything that happened before then. And the idea that white nationalists have been doing this forever, or sorry, not white nationalists, white supremacists, you know, even the idea of a white nationalist is a co-opting of like marginalized rhetoric around this stuff. You, you know, like one of the things that you see is that these debate bros try to sort of equate an indigenous resilience to invasion, you know, the continued invasion. And they try to sort of equate that to the blood and soil rhetoric of the Nazis. And the reality is those Nazis are using, how would you say it, like arguments or, or the, the kind of framework. But what's missing in that context, and I'll speak from sort of a Maori perspective here, they're not talking about Wairua. They're not talking about Whakapapa. They're not talking about our concepts. They're talking about this from like a white thing. And they're trying to take the language and, and co-opt it to... Um, seem as if it has legitimacy you know like that idea of saying oh it's not white nationalism it's it's called uh, white culture you know or, or th things like that we're trying to protect white culture i think it's pretty interesting that when we actually talk about these concepts without the baggage of you know how white nationals have co-opted these things um these people are completely flummoxed by it you know um and i think it's it, it's it's just one of those things where i think like it honestly says a lot more about that group that they aren't able to see um, this thing that they claim to sort of be, oh, I'm very good at identifying this thing because, you know, all I do is browse 4chan all day. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and I think that also if you really do look at the ways that this rhetoric of white nationalism and the great replacement myth and, uh, you know, even just reverse racism, these are all intentionally constructed psychological ops. These are operations that these that these fascist groups and these white supremacists intentionally inject into the discourse. Like white nationalism is a direct co-option of the ideas of black nationalism, right? It's not like a coincidence and it's not a coincidence that they intentionally craft their talking points to be this kind of um, white supremacist reflection of the liberation movement of black nationalism, right? So yes, there are parallels that can be drawn between white nationalism and black nationalism because the white nationalists sat down and looked at black nationalism, saw it as a threat, saw it as a successful movement, saw it as uh, you know something that could be threatening their role of, of privilege and, and white domination. And they constructed this whole idea of white nationalism as a rebranding of you know the Nazism that they were doing before. So it's it's really, no uh, I mean, surprise is there. These here's parallels. the thing. You can, you can look at, say, like Richard Spencer, and he's very open about the idea of remarketing white nationalism or, or say, you know, this white supremacy, neo-Nazi organization. He's very, he's right. very open about saying that, it, you know, in the 90s, it was skinheads and that didn't attract people. And so that they needed to, you know, make it seem like an intellectual movement. Experiencing the 9-11 era, and I became a extremely skeptical of that whole, you know, flag waving period. Let's all hold hands and get low interest mortgages and go shopping on credit card debt in order to save America. I knew that we had to get away from the conservative movement. By about mid 2008, I was using this term alternative right or alt right. That I care about my people. I care about my identity. I want to expand and deepen my identity. The first thing you always hear, and it's become a joke, is, ah, Adolf Hitler, ah, the Ku Klux Klan, ah, the Southern Confederacy. It's these boogeymen that are thrown at any legitimate and genuine movement for identity. And I think at some level, people want to throw them back in the face. And that's not, that's not like, you know, a new thing. Like, the whole reason they were skinheads during, like, the 80s and 90s and stuff, because they were... They were popular countercultures and they they, they yeah. use that to sort of get in as well and it's, same thing it's, they're trying to co-op the punks yeah you're right yeah mm, yeah and, and so like it, it's it's honestly i think just this thing where they don't know their own history when they talk about this stuff because they just get all their fucking information from wikipedia thanks for watching everybody i hope you enjoyed that and again if you did please consider checking out youtube.com slash non-compete live where you can watch our full live streams and watch them live or check out non-compete highlights where you can check out videos very similar to this one where we cut out the best from the conversations we're having with all these awesome comrades. And of course, check out Tali's game, Umurangi Generation. Uh, and again, just thank you so much for watching. Thanks for supporting the channel. And we'll see you next time. I'm EJ. Bye-bye. Subscribe, 